Much of what we know is based on what we're taught. Normal and natural are cultural concepts dependent on ideas that are passed through generations. There are some of these aspects of humankind that are universal, such as curiosity, passion, and fear. But what happens when curiosity goes beyond questioning, when passion becomes violent, and when fear is motivation rather than a deterrent? Hello, and welcome to Tales of Two Cities podcast. I'm Nikki, and this is our first of our annual Halloween Marathon of Minis. This year, by popular demand, we will again be featuring stories from a handful of different states, and a total of eight episodes released over the month of October. Last year, we featured the best and spookiest urban legends, but this year we've decided to be a bit more cemented in reality. While many call into question the reality of urban legends, no one will doubt the horror of a serial killer. I find it very difficult to dislike a person who has shared their story with me. There's something about vulnerability that makes room for understanding. I try to carry this with me as I meet new people, but also in thinking about people that I don't or can't know. Though there are stories that chill you to your core, sharing a darkness that you can't understand, the purely self-motivated, lacking a moral compass or empathy, The types of people who commit the unthinkable, again and again. We featured Jolly Jane in our marathon in March, and for those that don't know, she became a nurse so that she could experiment with poisoning her patients. She did it again and again. We often think of these people as monsters, those who were born just to cause damage. But still, it gets worse. What happens when those who kill are killing those that they know, that they love, the very people we hold closest. Hello? Welcome. This is Flames of the Two Cities. Oh, I'm so excited. Nanny Doss was born Nancy Hazel on November 4, 1905, in Blue Mountain, Alabama. She was one of five children to parents James F. Hazel and Louisa Lou Hazel. Nanny grew up in an abusive household. Her father, James, forced the children to work on the family farm instead of going to school and forbade the girls in wearing makeup and attractive clothing in order to not be, quote, molested by men. End quote. However, that obviously isn't the reason for rape, and unfortunately, Nanny was relentlessly molested by her uncle in her younger years. Nanny, like most serial killers, experienced a terrible brain injury at age seven when she smacked her head on a metal bar when her train suddenly stopped. Ever since then, she experienced headaches, blackouts, and depression. Despite her father's strict guidelines and restrictions against men, she adored romantic tales. She would spend her time reading her mother's romance magazines and eventually read the Lonely Hearts column. She first got married at age 16 to Charlie Braggs, her co-worker at the linen factory. After dating her for four months, they were married. When they did, they moved in with his mother. In a letter to her mother, she states, Quote, I married as my father wished in 1921 to a boy I hardly knowed for about five or four months and had no family, only a mother who was unwed and who had taken over my life completely when we were married. She had never seen anything wrong in what she had done, but she would take spells. She would not let my own mother stay all night, end quote. Bragg's mother was an unwelcoming cloud in Nanny's first marriage, She took a lot of his time and restricted Nanny's life. Nanny had four daughters from 1923 to 1927, which led to a lot of her stress. She started drinking, smoking, and eventually led to arguments and affairs. In 1927, the two middle girls died of food poisoning. Soon afterwards, Braggs and their firstborn, Melvina, fled. This left poor Florine behind. During that time, Nanny worked and supported them both and eventually Melvina came back 
because Braggs found love in a new divorcee. Nanny married her second husband, Frank Harrelson, when she was 24. They each found each other through the Lonely Hearts column. However, I have two stories about what happened to her kids. On one, she lived with them for 16 years in Jacksonville. And on another, Nanny fell in love with Frank and abandoned Florian and Melvina in their home. Eventually, the neighbors became concerned and called Charlie Braggs to pick them up. Now, another discrepancy I found was how she murdered her grandchildren. One story was that Florian forgave Nanny for abandoning her. She forgave her enough that she felt it was okay to leave her infant son, Baby Lee, at Nanny's home in Jacksonville, Alabama. The baby lived for three days, but died due to rat poisoning. Nanny declared that it was an accident. A different story states that Melvina gave birth to Baby Lee. In that story, Melvina gave birth to Baby Lee and then another child two years later, While she was still sedated from ether and exhausted from birthing, Melvina believed she saw a nanny stick a hairpin needle in the baby's temple. When she recovered and found out that the baby had died, she asked her sister and husband what had happened, in which they exclaimed that nanny had told them that the baby was dead, all while holding the pin in her hand. The grieving parents divorced, and Melvina met a soldier that nanny didn't approve of. While visiting her father, Melvina had an argument with Nanny, who was taking care of her son, Baby Lee. When she returned, she found out that the baby had died mysteriously on July 7, 1945. The official ruling was asphyxia. Two months later, Nanny collected the $500 life insurance on the baby, Robert Lee. Frank Harrelson was Nanny's next victim. An alcoholic and partier, he came home one night and raped Nanny. She, in turn, put rat poisoning in his corn whiskey jar. Harrelson died a slow and painful death that evening. Nanny went back to the Lonely Hearts column and met her third husband, Arlie Lang. She went to visit him in Lexington, North Carolina, and the two were married three days later. However, like her husband's before, Lanning was an alcoholic, and his eyes usually wandered towards other women. He supposedly died of heart failure in 1952. A lot of the women supported Nanny during that difficult time, but mysteriously afterwards, his house burnt down, and Nanny got the insurance money. In January of 1953, her mother died while she was taking care of a patient. Two of her sisters died that same year as well, in different towns, but each collapsed when Nanny was visiting them. They each got the same mysterious symptoms of stomach cramps and convulsion, which led to their deaths. In 1953, Nanny's fourth love, Richard Morton, died and was laid to rest from being poisoned in Emporia, Kansas. Nanny's last and final husband, Samuel Doss, died one month after their wedding. In his autopsy, it was revealed that he had enough arsenic to kill 20 men. After that reveal, Nanny decided to confess. She confessed to everything. In the last 10 decades, she had killed at least 10 people. Throughout her various confessions and years in jail, Nanny insisted that the murders weren't about the money. Her reasoning? She was bored. She wanted to find that perfect man. That's about it, Nanny told her interrogators. I was searching for the perfect mate, the real romance of life. She pled guilty on May 17, 1955, and was sentenced to life imprisonment. The state did not pursue the death penalty due to her gender. Doss died from leukemia in the hospital ward of the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in 1965. Lydia Danbury was born on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1824. She was an orphan as an infant, but was adopted by her uncle. When she was 16, she began working as a tailor, but by 17, she was married and soon began her long career in poisoning those closest to her. Lydia is known as the Derby Poisoner, America's Queen Killer, 
and the Poison Fiend, among other nicknames. She was an American serial killer who is reported to have been addicted to murder. Like Jolly Jane, Lydia is a rare exception, a female serial killer. Though what makes her story worse is, like Jolly Jane, she was killing relatives, mostly her husbands and children. Lydia looked like an average woman from the outside. Her true evil was buried underneath a slim frame, chestnut hair, pale skin, and sparkling blue eyes. It's reported that she often used her good looks as a way to distract from the horrendous acts that she committed. Her beauty drew some of her victims in. Her first husband, Edward Strzok, was smitten with 18-year-old Lydia. He proposed marriage almost immediately after meeting her in 1842. She accepted, despite him being 20 years older than her, a widower, and a father of six. Once married, they moved to a home on 125th Street in New York City. Soon, they had eight children of their own, and everything seemed normal until 1863, when Edward lost his job as a police officer. He fell into a deep and prolonged depression, and so begun Lydia's crimes. In her own published confession, Lydia Sherman, Confession of an Arch Murderess of Connecticut, she explained that rather than having him committed, she decided, quote, to put him out of the way as he would never be any good again. Her lack of empathy culminated in her mixing a thimble of arsenic into his oatmeal. After several hours of painful vomiting, diarrhea, and convulsions, Edward died. While she had fixed one problem, a depressed and, in her eyes, useless spouse, she soon realized that she had created a new one. She had killed the primary breadwinner for the family, which at this point consisted of herself and six of their children. Her eldest son, John, had moved out, and her young daughter, Josephine, had died years before of a mysterious illness. Some say that she had perhaps been her first victim. Soon after killing Edward, she turned her energy to the three youngest children. She decided that the three youngest, quote, could do nothing for themselves, and therefore it would be best to get rid of them, to get them, quote, out of the way. Fewer than six weeks after killing her husband, she poisoned all three children and watched them die in a single day. While horrendous, no one really noticed. It wasn't unlikely for children to die at a young age then. A single illness could easily wipe out an entire family. Now Lydia was free of most of her burdens, though still responsible for her remaining three children. Her life continued to improve when a sympathetic doctor decided to give her a job as a nurse. Soon, the final three children contracted various ailments, and, hating to see them suffer, she poisoned each of them. After killing her entire family, seven in all, and it going completely undetected, she was now free of all of her burdens. She moved a bit before settling on a nursing job in Stratford in 1867. Quickly, she found her next husband. She met Dennis Hurlbert, who was also a recent widower and very wealthy. He was known around town as Old Hurlbert, and soon he proposed to the much younger Lydia. He promised her, quote, all that he was worth. She accepted. Again, things seemed to be normal for a time until Lydia noticed that old Hurlbert seemed to be in pain from various ailments related to his age. She, of course, refused to watch him suffer. She poisoned her second husband and inherited $30,000 of his estate. That would be at least $500,000 today. The death of her second husband hit her especially hard, so hard that within eight weeks, she was connecting with Horatio Sherman, another recent widower who was looking for a mother for his children. As per Lydia's M.O., she married him and moved into his home within a few months. Though Horatio was a heavy drinker, and in a drunk rant, he made the mistake of mentioning that he almost wished his sickly infant son would die rather than watch him continue to be in pain. 
Of course, Lydia took him seriously. She mixed arsenic into the baby's bottle, and the child died within the day. Within a few months, she moved on to the teenage daughter, who had committed the heinous act of catching the flu in Lydia's care. Horatio was understandably distraught after the death of his children. He went on a week-long binge, drinking constantly. This triggered Lydia. She was upset by his alcoholism and his willingness to spend her inherited fortune. She soon decided to make him sick of liquor by spiking his brandy with arsenic. Horatio was dead within a few days, though this time was more suspicious than the others. Dr. Beardsley, a local physician from Yale, noticed Horatio's abrupt death and ordered an autopsy. The poison was detected, and the bodies of the Sherman children and Holbert were exhumed. Arsenic was detected in all of the victims, and Lydia was the connecting factor. Confronted, Lydia confessed to poisoning her three husbands and four children, and two of Horatio's children. Her trial began on April 16, 1872, and lasted eight days. She appeared again, prim and proper. She wore a black dress, shawl, gloves, and a hat with a veil. She claimed innocence despite her confession. Tabloids at the time called it the horror of the century. She was sentenced to life in prison for second-degree murder. But the story doesn't end there. Lydia escaped briefly in 1877 and had set herself up with another wealthy widower, though she was again apprehended before she could cause any damage. Shortly after, in 1878, she was found to have cancer and, unlike her victims, was forced to suffer through her illness before her death on May 16, 1878, at Wethersfield State Prison. Between 1873 and 1878, her confession was published, much to the delight of a curious public. Today, her total number of victims is believed to be as high as 10. In the beginning of this episode, Nikki brought up the frightening idea of losing the trust in the people that we hold closest. It's a scary thought. We always close our curtains and lock our doors when we go to sleep. But what happens when the ultimate danger is right behind you? Lydia Sherman and Nanny Doss were two sweet women who were monsters. They were two women who looked at their children and husbands in the eyes and killed them without a second thought. While it might seem sexist, women are not usually associated as being psychotic killers. That falls towards men. So when women, especially mothers, change that rule, it becomes startling to know that we don't know. We don't know anything about our own safety. What seems bad and dangerous might actually be your savior, and what is good will probably be your downfall. People are fickle and strange creatures. It's really hard to know what they are truly thinking about. That smile might be a facade, and those eyes might be yearning for your demise. Yes, it can be argued that Nanny Doss and Lydia Sherman are unique beasts, simple as that. But let me just end you off with this note. Their family, their neighbors, their friends, all thought that they were good ones, just like you do with yours. Stay tuned for our Halloween serial killer horror of minis. The tales are historically intriguing and handpicked by both Nikki and I. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can do so on our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and email at talesofthenumber2podcast at gmail.com. Please check out our merch store. We'll be adding more serial killer merch throughout the month of October. And please check out our Patreon. I produce many episodes on California urban legends that you can purchase for a one-time fee of $5. And, as always, thank you so much for listening.